This week we're going to start to read this parasha of Pinchas. In fact, the parasha is named after the man Pinchas, who became a hero at the end of last week's Torah portion when he stood up in defense of Moshe and in defense of Jewish law. And he took the law into his own hands, as it would appear, even though he was mandated to do so. And he reacted to the relationship between Zimri, who was a leader of the Jewish community, and Cosby, who was a Midianite princess, who were engaged in an inappropriate relationship, and he, he literally kills them both. It's a moment in Torah that is called Kanoim. It's the only time you have that expression in the five books of the Torah, that somebody is what's called a zealot. It's an unusual expression, to be a zealot. In today's world, I guess we'd call it a radical. So somebody who takes a very extreme position about a religious belief. And in today's world, I don't think that's necessarily a very uh, a welcome term, a religious fanatic. It's not necessarily something that you want to be called. But Pinchas, it's a big deal. And what happens is, in the beginning of this week's parasha, Hashem says in front of the whole community that I'm impressed and I'm pleased with what Pinchas has done. And because of what he has done, Hineni noisein lo brisi shaloi. I'm going to give him my covenant of peace. And it's a very intriguing thought because you would never anticipate that somebody engages in a violent act and the result of that is peace. Usually, you expect that peaceful behavior is what would bring peace. So there already is a lesson that under certain circumstances, sometimes the correct thing to do is to use force in order to achieve peace. It's an interesting concept. It's not what we're going to focus on today, but it is an interesting concept. Now, this individual, Pinchas, is uh, a person who breaks the rules, not only in the way that he behaves, but also in what happens next. Because as a result of him taking this law into his own hands and standing up against Zimri in front of the whole Jewish community, he's upgraded to a Kohen. Now, usually you can't get upgraded to a Kohen. Try, try as much as you want and pay as much as you want. It's, uh, there's nothing you can do. Either you're born into the line of Kohanim or you're not born into the line of Kohanim. But he's given this unusual opportunity to become a Kohen. He's also given something else. So we talk a lot about the fact that Pinchas is made into a Kohen in spite of the fact that he wasn't originally one. But he's given something else which is possibly more interesting for us. He's given Brisi Shalom. He's given Hashem's covenant of peace. In a Torah scroll, when you write that word Shalom, the Vav, Shalom is spelt Shin, Lamed, Vav, and then a final Mem. So the Vav inside a Torah scroll is written with a slight break in between the upper and lower part of the letter Vav, which is very interesting because a, a letter in Torah has to always be whole in order for the Torah to be kosher. But in this particular case, the letter Vav has to be split. And only if it has that split horizontally or diagonally through it, then it's a kosher Torah, which is really fascinating. And somehow that split or that broken vav is supposed to tell us something about what Hashem actually gave Pinchas. So what did he give him? He gave him this letter vav, <laughs> that he could use it, he could do something. He could somehow um, hold on to this letter vav and use it as a bargaining chip with Hashem. What does that mean? So vav is a letter that plays various roles in, in Torah language, in Hebrew. A vav is usually a conjunction. V means and. That's usually what it means. In fact, the shape of the letter vav is just a vertical line, which also implies conjunction, the connection between what's higher and what's lower. So in the same way as vav will connect two words to each other, vav will also connect a higher reality and a lower reality. And that's why there are various places throughout the stories in Tanakh where the vav actually plays um, a certain role. If you have a look in the Torah, there are a number of occasions where the name Yaakov is spelt unusually. Yaakov is normally spelt Yud, Ayin, Kuf, Vez. But there are a few occasions where it is spelt Yud, Ayin, Kuf, Vav, Vez. It's an unusual spelling. There are also the equal amount, as many times in the Torah as Yaakov is, is written with a Vav. So in the Tanakh, there are as many times where the name Eliyahu, Eliyahu is the prophet Elijah, that is normally spelled Aleph, Lamed, Yud, Hey, 
Vav is spelt without the Vav at the end. So the same amount of times that the Vav is included in Yaakov's name, it is missing from Eliyahu's name. So what's the connection between them? We know that Eliyahu had various jobs throughout history. While he was alive, he was a prophet like all the other prophets in the early Tanakh period. After he passed away, he becomes Eliyahu Malach Abris. He becomes the angel that has to... Eliyahu is the only human being who ever became an angel, right? He was taken up to heaven in a fiery chariot. And then he became an angel and he had the responsibility and has the responsibility until today to visit and participate in every single bris that ever happens anywhere in the world. So he becomes known as the angel of the bris. That's one job that he has. We also know that at the Pesach Seder, there comes a certain point where we go to the door and we open the door and we say that we're opening the door for Eliyahu. And we even put out a cup, a cup of wine that is called Elijah's cup. And it's a very interesting, we did a share on this once, if you remember, about uh, a number of years ago, about why it's called Elijah's cup. But in any event, the idea is that Eliyahu does not come to visit the Seder. It's not as if he has a responsibility like with a bris where he's got to attend every Seder around the world. It's because of his other job that we open the door for Eliyahu. Because Eliyahu is called Mevaser HaGeula. Eliyahu is the one who has to announce and herald the arrival of Mashiach. And that's why you find that there's certain interactions that sages had over the course of history with Eliyahu because he used to appear to certain sages and he used to teach them. And occasionally they would ask him, so knew what's happening with Mashiach? Because it's his job to herald and announce the arrival of Mashiach. On Pesach, when we anticipate the arrival of Mashiach, we open the door. We want to show that we're ready. We're opening the door. Eliyahu, you can come in. You can announce Mashiach and we'll go from here. So because Eliyahu is the person who's responsible for so to speak, starting the process of Mashiach coming, Yaakov, who out of the three patriarchs is considered the ultimate forefather of the Jewish people for obvious reasons, right? Because Abraham was the father of more than one nation. He had one son, Yitzchak, the Jewish lineage. He had another son, Yishmoel, the uh, Arabic lineage. Then he had other sons who he sent off to the east. Yitzchak also had two sons. He had Yaakov, who is the father of the Jewish lineage, and he had Esau, who is the father of the Edomite lineage, which became the West. But Yaakov is the one who had children, all of whom were Jewish. So out of all of the patriarchs, Yaakov, you could say in a sense, is the one who is really the father of the Jewish people, so much so that we call ourselves by the collective noun of his alternative name, Yisrael. So Yaakov feels very responsible for his children. And he's very, he feels very responsible that Mashiach should come as soon as possible. So he goes to Eliyahu and he says to Eliyahu, I need from you something that I can hold on to as collateral that will kind of force Hashem's hand in a sense or show me that I have a guarantee that Mashiach's going to come. So he takes the Vav from Eliyahu's name and he holds on to it. So every time that the Vav is missing from Eliyahu's name, it appears in Yaakov's name. To indicate the fact that Yaakov said, Eliyahu, I'm going to hang on to this part of you in order for me to have a guarantee that Mashiach is going to come. What was given to Pinchas? Pinchas is given Brisi Shalom. He's given this covenant of peace. Well, obviously, when Mashiach comes, that would be the ultimate experience of peace. So the Shalom, the peace that he was given, has a Vav that is split. The Vav is split. Part of the time, the Vav is with Eliyahu. Part of the time, the Vav is with Yaakov, because this is that letter that represents the guarantee Eliyahu had to give that Mashiach is coming. So what's that got to do with Pinchas? So it says, Pinchas ze Eliyahu, that there are very few people we are told in what's called Nigla, the revealed, the, the so-called non-mystical part of the Torah. There are very few people who we are told exactly what the nature of their reincarnation status is. And Pinchas is one of them. The Gemara tells us Pinchas and Eliyahu is the same person. Pinchas is reincarnated as Eliyahu, which is interesting, by the way, because really it should have said it the other way around. It should have said Eliyahu, who comes later in history, Ze Pinchas. He is the person who lived prior called Pinchas. But actually what the Gemara says is Pinchas, the man in our parasha, Ze Eliyahu. He is Eliyahu. What does that tell you? That tells you that Eliyahu, the individual who is supposed to herald Moshiach, pre-exists the human being called Pinchas. 
In other words, the primary soul, the primary nature of this individual, a soul that would reincarnate over time, his primary role is to herald Moshiach. In this particular incarnation, in this particular story, he played a slightly different role where he stood up and uh, brought Zimri and Cosby to justice over their misbehavior. But who is he really? Who is Pinchas really? He's really Eliyahu. So that's why in this week's parasha, when we're told that he's got this brisi shalom, he's got this covenant of peace that Hashem gives to him, the vav of the word shalom is the split vav. Because that tells you the whole story of everything that he is about, what his life's mission is, what his soul's mission is, which is to herald and bring the coming of Mashiach. And that is represented by this letter vav, which shows that he's got the responsibility to ensure that it has to happen. Now we're in good hands then, because we see in this week's parish that Pinchas is a guy who doesn't stand around and wait for other people to take care of what needs to be done. When there's an issue on the table, even if Moshe himself is silent, Pinchas has the courage to stand up and say, this is what needs to happen. And he's considered the, the icon of what we call Zrizin, somebody who is enthusiastic to do what Hashem wants. So that way we know that we're in good hands. The minute it's an appropriate time for Mashiach to come, straight away Pinchas is on the case. And he'll rush things, and there will be absolutely no delay, as the expression goes, that when the right time comes from Mashiach, Hashem won't even delay it the length of the blink of an eye. Please God, that day should be today.